So hi, my name is Rolf. I'm uh, from Germany, and if you're on Pelmonks, you know me, most probably. I'm one of the trolls over there with 5,000 posts. God thanks. And I want to uh, tell you today about a, a, a model I thought of about extending Perl in a way which is safe, compatible, backwards compatible, and allows a lot of experimenting and an evolutionary way to do things. And I'm talking about Perl 5. Let's give you an overview. Um, Perl 6 was designed because Perl 5 had a lot of, let's say, caveats and problems and was hard to extend. And Perl 6 development started, I think, in the year 2000. Every year we added a new, a new floor, and now we are at 2016, and the first people are moving in, but we're, it's still under construction. Uh, but it's the answer to all questions. But in the meantime, if you look at the, at the evolution, you have a constant evolution from older Perl versions, and then you have a big gap to Perl 6, where you have a compatibility problem. And the problem is, Till Perl 6 really comes in and can replace Perl 5, it will take years. And in the meantime, we have to bridge the gap somehow and have a way to at least have some of the features we are missing. There are existing approaches to extend Perl. I don't want to go into the details of all of them, but all have some cave eats. Source filters, we don't need to talk about it. XS, well, who can do them? Pluggable keywords. One of the features where people say, well, might be deprecated, it's experimental. Changing core and universal, hmm, Overlaid, overloading operators, well, if you really know what you're doing. Devil declare, other brand new features, probably deprecated soon. I just say smart match. I don't know. If you look in the, in the deltas, how many times smart match was changed, you don't want to use it anymore. So what's the best approach? We have a, 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 um, a big variety of possibilities to change the syntax of Perl, like with Mr. Gadget, but they are not always uh, compatible to each other. The, com uh, the uh, complexity of Perl is limiting such approaches because it's not always reliable, it's complex, it's breaking other development tools. I mean, you have new keywords and your editor doesn't highlight them anymore. It's critical in edge cases. It does work in 90% of the cases, well, but avoid the last 10%. It may be too slow because it's clean, but too slow. It's what it already depends on Perl 5.20, but you're still on CentOS and you're obliged to work with Perl 5.8. So my point of view is only Perl can, per can pass Perl and just use the fucking Perl parser to pass Perl. Keep it simple, stay compatible. I will show you two techniques now which build on each other to fulfill this. The one is functional sugar, just chaining functions which pass objects from one function to the other and you can do a lot of stuff I will show you. You can create pseudo operators, you can have combined statements, you can have signatures. And macro extensions, it's a it's a patch I did with BDPars to gain maximum performance, reliable anal analysis of syntax, and more flexibility. Let's go in medias race. Let's see at one feature of Perl 6, cross products. Do you all know the cross product? Who doesn't know the cross product? Okay. So one, you have two arrays. In Perl 6, you can br uh, multiply two arrays and you have each combination of each element of each error. Uh, you got it. So you're creating pairwise combinations of two lists. What you could do in Perl is, Perl 5, I mean, you just define a function, big X. We see the operator, that's a real operator in Perl 6. This is just a function called X. It's a big one. You give him a prototype. He takes a block and a list, an optional list. And then you can write x12 in a function, in the function block, which returns a list, and another x with an array, and you can get the same result. Just what's happening, 
these functions are chained and passing an object to each other and the objects tell them oh we the first x tell them I have a list with the elements of array a the other one knows I have a, a list of the elements one and two from the block I can have any kind of source code here and when the last x is called in a in a in a list context, it just passes all the cross products of the elements. So we just designed a cross operator in a compatible way to map and grab. Everywhere where we use map and grab, we can use the cross operator. We can use it like here when you're expecting a list in a for loop and you have the cross product of 0 to uh, 10 times 10, 100 elements are passed here. So it's compatible because it, pass, it fits into the syntax and it's freely uh, combinable with map and grab and we, would even use, we could use even uh, dollar underscore to extend it beyond Perl6 behavior. I don't want to go into the details here, but because this is just a source block, a function block, you can pass any kind of, of code here so you can go beyond the possibilities. So just com uh, compare this and this. Do you think, who thinks it's not close enough? Thank you. <laughs> That's uh, emotional pressure. <laughs> you can be mean afterwards. Um, other operators, let's, it's not, it doesn't only work with X. Let's say we have meta and hype operators in Pulse 6. This is a meta operator, it takes pairwise, no, it takes like a zip. All you know, these two arrays uh, have the same length, they have three elements, and they're taking them pairwise and multiplying the, elem uh, the elements, and you get the multiplication result in the last array. Clear? The other one is uh, just assigning to dollar $x, like uh, it's an assignment operation with a plus, every element. That's the same like here, just with a plus, and it's pro, uh, done with dollar $x, uh, with at $x, and you can also invert an array. So B is just the inverted element of A. And you, um, you still have the same problem that the, that, uh, the projector doesn't show all, this, all of this, but in the video it will be perfect. Um, we couldn't extend the syntax I showed you just by passing, uh, the first element could just be a, an operator to these axes. So this is when the cross product and you want to multiply all elements. This is uh, if you want to, to zip add or for same sized arrays, if you want an implicit assignment, it's all possible, you can even pass a, an anonymous sub. So much to operators. Now let's get to something called uh, list comprehensions. Let's take a concrete problem. We have a, a Pythagorean, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, pronounce in English, Pythag Pythagorean uh, equation. A square plus B square is C square. And we want all uh, solutions with whole numbers to, uh, let's say, where a plus b plus c is 1000 with a side condition. And then give me the first 10 possible solutions. Now let's solve this in Perl 5. This is the code more or less you would write. You would say you want, you want to be flexible about the, how many you, uh, solutions you get, so you make a nested loop, you let uh, b is going from uh, so my C, you say um, C is free. You make a nested loop for B, for, d for A, you, make the c uh, you check the condition, and you check the other condition, I think. I forgot to uh, do it inside, it's, a, it's an error. And uh, you push the result inside, so you have to check that the, 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 the sum is 1002, but you believe me. And you push the result into the result set, and you say you, you break you make the last loop when it's uh, the number of solutions you want is arrived. Clear? Now, how would look this look like in Haskell? Does it look prettier? 
Why? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> wrong question. Condition. Okay, true. Okay, let's say we forgot and uh, forget about the condition. This is the same code. Okay? So why is this far better? First, it allows infinite ranges. I can say, I don't have to say C is limited. I don't know how big C might get when I want to have 1,000 solutions. It allows lazy calculation. This is just an iterator. If you don't know what an iterator is, it's something you call and it gives you always the next result. So I get an iterator and can tell him, give me the 10 first solutions, then give me the next 10 solutions, then give me the next 10 solutions, and if, I'm, uh, if I have the solution I wanted, I can stop it. So I don't have to say before how many solutions I want, and then I have to start the loop again. It creates a stream which can pass away, uh, around. So I don't have to, this take doesn't have to, I don't have to take it right away. I can take this as, a as, uh, as an object of a stream, pass it as a return from a uh, subroutine to another subroutine, and then the result says take 10. And take n dynamically returns the next n results. So I can repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. So we can simulate this in Perl 5 with prototypes. What I did was I defined a function take and defined a function from. And what they do there, when you call them like this, this is just uh, syntactic sugar to use the fat uh, arrow, uh, the fat comma. It just, if you go into the details, what this means is we have a function call where the third argument is a function call which has one, two, three arguments, and the third argument is another function call. Clear? This is how this syntax works. And this is much nicer. And the, who doesn't know how prototypes work? Okay. This uh, ampersand prototype means you're passing a function block, which means this is an anonymous subroutine. This is an anonymous subroutine, and this is an anonymous subroutine. But within the first parameter is a reference to a subroutine I can call, and I get the result back from what is within this code. And then you have one uh, mandatory uh, scalar uh, value, and then you have an optional one. So I can call take without a third argument. I can call from without the second and the third argument. So this can be chained. It's called like this, and it works. I will not, won't show you the code. You can go on one of my older slides, older presentations, if you're interested in the details. What's happening is that from is just creating an object with the information, what it wants to do. It passes it to the next from. It combines the two iterators together to have a combined iterator. And then finally, the take gets this uh, combined iterator from the form and just calls the iterator and knows how many times it wants to do it. Because of uh, the lexical uh, scope of the uh, variables, these are the same variables, $A, $B. And because Perl has a uh, call by uh, reference, which means the, uh, the variables you get in the add underscore are read write, they are aliases. The from can manipulate the value from the second argument. So I don't want to go into the details, but this is, I'm going to talk about syntax more than about the details. So you can implement it. It's just two cave eats, it's, it's, um, slower than in Haskell, because it's not compiled the same way. And um, you can't write my dollar $A, my dollar $B here, because uh, you have to do it uh, before in the statement before, because Perl just accepts uh, declarations for the lines which come. This is a little cave eat. So you have to, dollar $A, dollar $B are anyway, they are global uh, variables which n don't need to be declared. You can export dollar $C, dollar $D, and so on as a global variable if you want to do this. But these are details. So next example, signatures. 
and parameter evaluation. Pell 5, this, oh, I'm good in the time. Am I too fast? I've, I will uh, finish early and we have time to discuss. Pell 5 has only params check in core since 5.9.5. Till since 5.20 we have uh, signatures somehow, but I will call, uh, talk about the KFEs. So we do parameter check, params check. This is what it accepts as arguments. This is a template how the parameters which are passed pass have to be parsed. First name, last name, gender, named arguments which are required, defined, and which variables to store them in. Then you have to call pass. Uh, I don't want to go into the details. I don't know, does anyone use it? It's a core module. But nobody uses it. Why? Because it's ugly. Do you instantly understand what's happening here? It's, it's far too, mu too much code to write. Now, there's a module which is very inspiring, which is called Smart Arcs, which uses a trick so you don't have to pass the, uh, the when, you when you call the function through personal info, you have to fill in the, you have to, to pass the arguments, you have to, uh, to call uh, the parse uh, with uh, a reference to the add. So smart args doesn't need it. You can write args, my dollar p is an integer and so on. Much nicer, it's on cpan. Has positional arguments, has named arguments. Yeah, but it's nice, isn't it? But it could be nicer. So what I'm working on, oh, well, we will have problems with lines which are not displayed. What I'm working on is more sugar. I wrote, I'm writing at the moment, it's not released, but it's working quite well, uh, in a module called SubSig, which does allow you to, to write this kind of syntax. My dollar $x, my dollar $y, uh, uh, and my dollar $z are three positional arguments. And Z has a default argument uh, value from 42. Or you have named arguments, my dollar key, my dollar value, and the default of dollar value is 666. Or you have um, uh, differently named arguments. So you say you're passing the argument ID, named argument ID but it has to be stored in the, in the, in the variable dollar key. Or you have optional arguments, that it means you, when you, well, any argument which has a default value is optional, logically, because why should you assign a default value if, it, uh, if it's not optional? But maybe you want to have uh, an argument which is undef, if not defined, but still optional. You can use attributes for it. Or you can have constraints. You can use attributes uh, for to say that it's an integer, and you can even have constraint clauses. But that's it's a little bit difficult to implement all of this. That's why I'm working on it. But I want to show you how the syntax works in the end. Foo is uh, just one function I call, and it gets args. My dollar x is a positional variable which has to be set, and this is a named variable bar and has to set the variable dollar my. So the my variables, dollar x and dollar y, belong to the scope of foo. You get it? So most uh, signature hacks I've seen have the big problem that they can't handle lexical variables. Because the lexical variables here belong to the scope of foo and not to the uh, scope of args that can be set. But args gets uh, the variables as aliases. They say these are aliases to dollar $x, to the literal bar, and to the to dollar $y. And it sees the values undef, my dollar $x is undef. It sees the value bar, because this is the second argument. And it sees the value def, because that's the default value we have set into, into dollar $y. Now when I'm parsing this within arcs, I get only dollar one is a read-only literal. Bar is dollar one. I can use Scala utils read-only, and it tells me it's a literal because if you won't try, it would try to set dollar one. 
you would get an error because literals are read-only values. Dollar zero and dollar two are targets. So as no, the uh, the f the first and the third argument are to be set, and defined values like def are default. So I know dollar two, dollar underscore two, has a default. So the con consequence is this is a mandatory variable which is positional, and dollar underscore two. This is just the name of this variable which has to be set. With the uh, with a value which is was named bar, and has the default def. Clear? <laughs> yeah, good question. They are not. This is a literal bar, and it. Believe me, check it. You can call a function like this and try to set the second argument and the third argument. And the third will, try, will work because Perl knows internally that this is my dollar $y. This is an alias, it's an, it's an... No, it's not, it's not. Def, def is... You're passing here my dollar $y. It, believe me, just check it out. Is it the way Perl works? My dollar y, and this is just the default of this variable. And you can check, these are aliases, and you can set the third argument, but you can't set the second one, because this is a literal. I can show you the code. Okay, let's go on. We have uh, plenty of time afterwards for discussions, okay? Nero? In the next slide. I'm using the next slide, and a miracle occurs, and <laughs> <laughs> so my, my, my fault, sorry, I asked questions. So how does args know what to set? So it's a debugger feature. It's, it's documented, but it is obscure, and that's how smart args works. If you go into perldoc-f caller, it sets. It says, if you call caller one, in the context of package db, which is debugger, it will set the variable db args with the arguments level of the level one. Practically, nobody knows, and it's documented, but it's so badly documented that nobody ex understands it. I think if you look into the code of CARP, you will find it again, because CARP can give you the call stack and all the arguments which were given. And that's why what I'm doing, um, uh, we had a discussion on Perlmonks about this module, and we were wondering how does it work, and we found out years ago, I have to say, I have a lot of projects, so it takes some time. No, no complaints, good. And that's what I'm doing. So I'm getting in DB arcs the arguments of foo within the subroutine arcs. So I can pass the arguments which are passed to arcs. I get all these conditions, and I can use DB arcs. Uh, you get the idea. And I can say, well, I'm expecting at least one argument because the first one is mandatory. Then uh, the, the other ones have to are named arguments, so I'm just uh, doing a slide here. And then I'm setting them. Dollar underscore zero is the first argument I know because I passed the signature. It's db arc zero, and dollar underscore two is, unfortunately I can't uh, push the slides up, is dollar named bar because, so default is already set. The defaults are already passed into arcs because def is value, and it is overwritten only if it's undefined. Okay, you get the idea? There's one problem here. I won't talk about it unless you see it. Okay. Well, the, the problem is later. Now it's still clear. Well, maybe this has to be, has to be lexical. Well, this is a problem, my named. So, problems I'm encountering here are first design hell. Because unfortunately, before I hack, I'm thinking about the best design. And this is really, really more complicated than hacking. 
So shall I take the model from Perl 6? Shall I take the model from Perl 520? Shall I look into uh, traditional CPAN modules? Like when it's, when what is mandatory, when is it optional, are named, named with defaults optional or mandatory and so on. So this can be used, this can be solved with a um, lot of um, meditations and looking into the Perl 6 discussions. But I will give you an, uh, an example of something which uh, is not possible, which should raise an exception. If you have my dollar $x and my dollar $o, which are positional arguments, and you have here a named argument bar, but dollar $o has a default, it means it's optional. And if, if I, can one, I can have one or two positional arguments, I don't know where the named arguments start. That's why this is forbidden. After an optional argument, you can't have named arguments. So this is a part of the design hell. So this is soon to come. I, I wanted to release it only already on GitHub, but you know, conference-driven development, and I have a job which doesn't pay me for this, so I have 10 hours which are blocked per day. So, But I have soon uh, holidays, so I can do this for you. <laughs> who, who might use it? Okay, well, the good thing is we can use it at work because speed doesn't matter. But let's talk about the problems. First, speed one, capital problem, because it has Sandra and Keanu within. And um, if you're passing the signature each time, it's very expensive, because there's a lot of logic, positional, named, and so on. You can lose, uh, uh, the solution is memorizing. The first time, arcs is called, let's say, you have the function foo, which is called 1,000 times. The but each time, it's the same signature. So the first time it's called, you do the parsing, and then you're caching the result of the parsing by memorizing it with file, line, of package of the caller. Because if you use caller, you get file, line, and package of the function which called you, foo, and so on, and the name of the function. So parsing needs only to be done once and can be memorized. I think I skipped a problem. No, design, speed. So this can be solved. And now a minor problem, it's without Keanu. It's speed still. If you have foo and you call arcs with a signature, you still have the overhead of an extra function call. And if you want to write performant code, you don't want to have an extra function calls because function calls in Perl are expensive. So we have this overhead, and yes, we could optimize and memoize, but we don't get away from the overhead of calling arcs each time. What we really want is to inline the code somehow after analyzing the signature. What does inlining mean? We want to have a miracle which occurs, and the body, the original body, is prepended by this code. And this, how, how far I know, it's, it's more or less the same way signatures are implemented in 520. They, they are, when you use deep parts of a function with a signature, you will see a uh, code you've never written, which is integrated. So what we need here is something like macros. So to understand how my implementation of macros work, and why I say let Perl do the parsing, because only Perl can parse Perl, is we have to understand what the op tree is. Does everybody know what an op tree is? If you are compiling Perl, because Perl is an interpreted language, but it's, it has a compile state to run faster. It's, if you're compiling, if you're running Perl, the first step is compiling. It parses the code and translate every uh, element of the syntax tree into an, op, uh, into an operator, which is uh, optimized to run much faster. And if the code is run, only the op tree is executed. And the op tree is nested because you can have, like, let's say you have just the code take one plus two. This is, if you, if you call Perl minus mo terse, which means use the module B terse. 
and then uh, minus E for evaluate on some code, you will see the op tree of the code. And this is one way to display the code. And you say here, take one plus two, and this is the op tree, enter a subroutine, which will be, uh, which will be pp enter sub later, you have to put this in memory. And this is the name of the subroutine to be called. And this is the argument which is passed, three. Why three? Because one plus two is automatically optimi optimized by Perl. That's one of the, of the things you have to think about, that uh, things which are constant, which can't be uh, changed anymore, are optimized and inlined. So if you run BD parse, it's the second step. What does BD parse do? BD parse compiles the code and then it tries to decompile the code. It hacks into the op tree. If you see Perl minus O, D parse, uh, take one plus two. And this you can't read, it we will see take three as a, as a string. So you get more or less the original code back, how Perl sees the code. I can only recommend, if it, it, who doesn't know BD parts? Yeah, so if you have problems with your syntax, you don't know what, it, what the fuck is Perl doing at the moment. Why doesn't it work? Just use BD parts with a snippet of your code and maybe you can find the problem. Oh my God, why is it parsing like this? It's a very good tool. But what's nice about DP, DB parts is it's written in Perl. It really, it has, a, it has a callbacks, it sends, and it's walking the tree. And for each tree element of each operator, it calls a, f a Perl function, which is returning a string up the tree till all the strings are uh, composed again. And if you enter the, uh, if you reach the operator enter sub, it's calling the function pp enter sub. Okay, it's a little bit dry, but I will give you an example how to use it. I have a module on CPAN, my first module, I think. I'm not good in, re in uh, um, publishing, called Data Dumper Lazy. What does Data Dumper Lazy do? Bec but, uh, well, to be more precise, what's the problem? If you use Data Dumper normally, from the module Data Dumper, the function Dumper, you don't get the name of the variable you're dumping. And that's annoying, and that often. You have, to, you have to duplicate your code, it's not dry. You have to repeat yourself, you have to say, oh, my hash h has the value, and it has an ugly syntax to set this dollar var one. So if it doesn't know the name, it just takes one template one. If you call the function code ref to text, and you define a function dump, which takes a, a function block, a code block, and you call it like this, then the values of these variables are returned from the code block. And this is a code block. I can call BD parse code ref to text, and then I get this text back from DB parse. So I can match the results I get with the names I get. There are already two modules from Ovid which are addressing the same thing, which have both have a, a problem. The first one is using, um, um, forgot the name. <laughs> you know this kind of magic was parsing the code? Uh, yeah. Hmm? No. Source filter. The one is using source filters. It's even using a module from Damien, filter simple, I think. The other one is using Petwalker. And Petwalker has one limitation, you can't use it in evil code. Try to use Petwalker in within the debugger, you won't see anything because it doesn't get the, f the variable names for, uh, in the evil. But okay, that's um, a minor thing. How much time do I have left? 25 minutes? What? Um, so the in terms of BD parse, BD parse is written in Perl. It walks the tree. I told you uh, when it enters PP enter sub for the OP enters uh, for the operator enter sub, and methods uh, report source snippets up the tree. 
You call it sub like take one plus two. So that's what we saw here. And it's returning a, a, a string. So what I did was I monkey patched this subroutine pp enter sub. So I said, instead of returning the string, no. Sorry, no, I lost context. We are here. So what does monkey patching mean? I can override this subroutine, pp enter sub, and make an, a wrapper subroutine, which calls pp enter sub, gets this take call, knows the argument, and changes what is reported back to BD pass. So I'm reg reg uh, recombining lower snippets of the code, and it's much more rea reliable of, uh, than source filters, because the op tree is the canonical representation of the Perl code. I'm not using a source filter to analyze with some reg access the Perl code, but I get the canonical normalized representation of the code. So, yeah. Le le so only Perl can pass Perl, so let Perl do it for us. Let's have an example. This will take a little while. We have in Perl 6 an idiom called gather take. Gather take is, uh, returns a lazy list, and we say for the elements from 0 to 20, we want all even numbers. And we say take dollar or i. We were talking about lazy iterators. What does it mean? Gather take can be called like an iterator 20 times, it's giving me 20 results, and then it stores the context, what it does. And then it continues where it stopped. If you know Python, there's the yield command which does something similar with generators. This can only be roughly done in Perl 5. This is a for loop which pushes into an array, but this is not lazy because I can't continue. If I want to have the 21st and 22nd result, I have to start from new because the, 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 the state isn't stored. But we could solve it with an ugly simulation with go to. I'm storing here, I'm doing the, the check if i is even, dollar i is even. And there I store the re-entry point in a variable. Enter one, I do the return from the subroutine. And the next time the subroutine is entered, the first time dollar entry isn't set. So it's not, it's not defined. So it goes on, it does the loop, at the moment where it enters this, it does the return, and then it goes back, it knows the re-entry point. And like this, we have, uh, I think they are called coroutines. I'm not sure in IT. And at the end, if everything is done, we say entry is finished, and we don't return anything anymore. It's a state variable, yes. In this example, it's a state variable. And my dollar entry is a, is a closure variable. So, so what does it have to do with macros? We can now have a pretty Perl 5 notation. We can write it like this. We can define a function gather. We can define a function take. Like I told you, which function signatures? Take takes a uh, gather takes a code block. Take takes uh, take takes. Well, take has uh, some uh, thing to return. It's, it's in indeed only in return. What we do is this has to be a macro which is expanded. We have to wrap the go to logic, this part, and this part around it. And we have to replace the take part with this part. This is how macros work. And this without source filter. So this is how it looks like. We define take as a macro. You can find the code my, in GitHub from my account Langs. It's called macro the module. I'm planning to release it as macro repass because the namespace macro is already taken. And it already works, so it's not fictional. It's no science fiction. It's not with Keanu, not with Sandra Bullock. 
So the take macro just returns this construct we have seen, the expansion, and it sets the re-entry point in this case, and the gather takes a code block, it gets the, puts the dispatcher code in front, the exit code, these are the start and the ending, and gets a new body by expanding the block it gets. The code block is here, this part, and expanding, and expanding means it replaces take which with the return of the function take, because it's a macro. Gather take, if you want to export, is in the examples of this module, uh, in the example section of the module uh, macro. So advantages, just a moment. We have a, a big time for, for questions, so if it's a short question only. Examples, uh, advantages of this approach is it's a minimal patch in BD pass. BD pass is part of course since 98. It's written in Perl, so no need for lengthy P5P discussions to implement it. No C or preprocessor wizardy. We had plenty of talks of how to uh, understand XS and C and macros in C and preprocessor and I don't know. And it's in the end less complex than fiscal laws uh, and less. <coughs> well, I don't know, yeah, maybe Cayman Islands are easier. <laughs> but Germany for sure not. It has some open issues, which uh, some of them are solved already. Uh, you have to do. You have to talk about um, um, variables which are polluting the namespace. If you have to take care that the na variables you're introducing with your macro are not polluting the namespace, because you're exporting variables in the upper namespace. And reval might use the closure variables. It's uh, well. It's a little bit. Um, far, we can talk about it later, but I solved this, I used Petwalker to get all the closure variables from the block, so because I will show you, when I take gather here and I have some variables inside here in the gather block, which come from the upper scope, and I'm re-evaluating this block, the upper scope is lost. So I have to identify the variables which happen in this code block and to set them again to the reference of the variable of the upper scope. That's what Petwalker does. Uh, Go to can jump in for each. Let's talk this later. So what's next? I think it was one hour, so it should go till 55. Okay. Much research, meditation about extension gadgets in Perl. And my minimal goal is to have a, a syntax toolkit to extend Perl to have something like domain-specific languages. I wanted to show you an example of an SQL DSL I wrote. Unfortunately, uh, um, I didn't have time to include it in the, in the slides. Uh, who's interested can address me. Uh, like link is something in other languages which is used in the Microsoft languages to, to have these uh, SQL DSLs, GUI wrappers, data formats, and the sex appeal of Ruby, the success of Ruby had a lot to do with the DSLs of the nice syntax you could do. You had a question, is already done, or? You mean this one? Um, it's solved. It's done by uh, use Petwalker and parsing the code, and I can tell which are coming from the upper scope, which are coming from the lower scope. And then they are uh, they are transfer, uh, transferred into lexical variables. State is not very correct in this place, but you're right. It's a good question. Yeah, it, it identifies each variable in the gather take, uh, which is um, well in this case it's my, not a state variable. But 
this will be reproduced by the DBD parse. And it identifies, but I can, uh, with Petwalker, I can easily identify variables which belong to this scope and variables which are from the upper scope, from the closure. So, so my idea and my suggestion for ex expa expanding, uh, extending the syntax in Perl is to have a multi-phase approach. I've showed you how to emulate combined uh, statements like uh, from take. I've showed you an approach to uh, simulate operators. I've showed you an approach to simulate uh, signatures in a purely functional way. And this works, but it's slow. But it's very easy. I mean, Everybody, we have CPEN, we have thousands of authors, not only P5P, who could produce functional solutions. And then, if they want to speed them up, they can use macros. And I don't say that my solution is the best one, but at the moment it's the only one. But to, to, to have a motivation for P5P or any wizard in C and so on, and that's why if you've been at the talk of Sawyer yesterday and asked about macros, you know now why. So if you have a cleaner implementation of macros, I would love it, because Lisp lives from macros, functional macros. These are, there's also inline macros, which is uh, line macros, which is different in Lisp, but this is a, a killer feature in Lisp. And if you look into Emacs, for example, a lot of things which are uh, miss, which were missing in this base language, Emacs Lisp, were re-implemented with macros later on. Then we could see, because we, we reduced ourselves only to functions to have all these solutions, which looked weird for you. We're not hacking into the parser, uh, uh, inventing new operators, and so on. So if you use XS to speed these up, if we say we don't want to have macros, we want to have an XS solution, which costs more, we could even go further on, stabilize it much more, and speed it up with XS code, and there we can do really do everything if you understand XS. And then, if we are, if a solution survived all these steps and is reliable and accepted by the community, we can introduce it into core one day, which can take years. Now, compare this to the usual approach. Smart match. Smart match were introduced, P5P was discussing it, and then uh, it failed somehow. We had to, it had two, three, four pages of documentation. I read it 10 times, I didn't understand how it works. It had cases if you have the uh, operators in the left side, right hand side, or in the right hand side or the left side. So it, it, it proved to be too complicated. So they changed it and changed it and changed it. You have this one construct with uh, switch statements, which is called while, no, when, given when. Given when, given when failed because it's, it's, uh, it's implemented on smart match. And so, so this is the problem if we start from the top. But if we have an evolutionary concept, and I was talking about evolution, we can have an ecosystem of uh, approaches to have functional solutions, speed them up with macros, speed them up with XS, and if they survived and are accepted by the community, we can integrate them into core. We are already om almost done. Unfortunately, the, there is a time slide uh, on the top you can't see. It's here. We are already here. So we are here. So uh, this approach is transparent for the masses. We can have much more developers which work on solutions. We don't need only the nuclear scientists of P5P. And I'm not on the P5P mailing list for, for good reasons. Uh, we can have fast prototyping and application of solution, production testing without deprecation risk. Because if we build on functions, 
it fucking works on 5.8 or 5.6. And we have an immediate return of investment. So what's the target? What's the design strategy? I think Perl 6 design of statements like gather take, I wouldn't uh, call it uh, yield now or something like this. I would look into Perl 6 because there was a lot of intelligence in the design of Perl 6, a lot of discussions. Where are the weaknesses of Perl 5? And we should copy Perl 6 in the way. So based on this analysis of Perl 5 weaknesses, no need to reinvent the wheel then. We take the concepts and we have a synergy between the teams. So we can, the people which are re-implementing things for Perl 5 maybe can ask the people from Perl 6, what does the apocalypse XX, I don't know what means. I'm not so religious, I don't understand apocalypses anyway. And we have a better compatibility in both directions, so the both communities can talk much better and use the synergy. Then we could steal cool stuff from other languages. There's this book with from O'Reilly, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, which was hyped very much last years, which is which starts with the first chapter with Ruby, only shows features which are already implemented in Perl, says how cool it is to have a postfix if in Ruby, which was stolen from Perl because Ruby is basically Perl's nice syntax and some um, some object stuff. So smart oh, pun and broke namespaces, yeah, because it doesn't have my. And so, but seven language seven weeks shows cool features. We could go into these uh, examples and you can learn, uh, re-implement stuff and learn these languages like Haskell and Scala. And my dream is to have a missing link. Thankfully, this uh, picture is a little, a little bit dark because this has to be an ape face. Didn't have the time to, to use GIMP accordingly because at the beginning, we had a robot at the right side, at the left side, we had an ape, and this is the kind we can armor Perl 5, we can add some features. We won't have a real robot, we could have something, uh, in, uh, it's something which is filling in the gap. A missing link combining features. So, I'm in the end. Thank you. Questions? Yep. I didn't try to subclass it because I didn't see the advantage. <laughs> you can explain to me later. I think did you did you someone uh, g went into my g GitHub account and sent me this message? Was it you? Yeah. So, same question two years ago. We can talk about later. I didn't see the advantage. You can explain it to me. I'm not so much an O uh, programmer, and I looked into the subclassing is just another way to do it, and I find monkey patching much cleaner for my. You can show me, if you show me a real case where it, where it fails, I will happily do it. Do a pull request, sh send better code, it's on GitHub. Next question? Uh, sorry, but can we discuss it later? Who was lost? Uh, uh, just have another question. Yeah. Uh, in your uh, initial comments with the argument parsing properly, yeah. you seem to be using the signatures then for that uh, a lot. Um, how do you deal with the problem that if you if there are a pull request that is like this, it the unstringed i looks like it if it were running in stringages. You were talking about signatures? Yeah, and especially signatures with post references in them. Uh, so to the unstringed I a return from such a construct like What do you mean with a with a code uh, reference? As a as a de as a no default no value? Oh, you were talking about, ah, no, no, sorry, 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 yes. 
How can I distinguish I'm passing back an object? I understand your question. Okay, the question is, can I repeat? And then you tell me if it's the right question. So here we are chaining uh, functions. And the third argument is an iterator which is passed back. So, but it could be that a uh, 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 function reference is part of a list, a scalar value in a list, which is not supposed to be an iterator. And then how does take know that uh, the, the argument it gets from from is really another iterator which belongs to the syntax, is not a part of some uh, arguments which are passed as a list of, uh, of references, right? Uh, not exactly, but you, you can answer Okay. <laughs> That's why I called it monadic functions. If you know monads, I'm passing back from from and take and other constructs objects which are blessed in special they are blessed in a special namespace, a special class. And by knowing that it belongs to this, this class, I know it's, not, it's, a, it's, it's an exception, it belongs to the syntax, and I can catch syntax errors. And if it's a function reference, which is an, uh, from another object, it's just a scalar value which has to belong to the list. Okay? True. I didn't look. I didn't look into try time here. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, but you know you. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, if you have function blocks, well, this is also a problem. Yeah, you have this in the map syntax with blocks because the return there doesn't belong to the block, yes. which is also confusing people. It's confusing for both sides because some people, we had this discussion on Perlmonks once, does is the block from a map uh, construction. If you have map code block here and you write return, it returns from the function of the upper context. Not because this is not really an anonymous function. That's the implementation in Perl. But this is also confusing people. Well, you have to document it. Okay. But, 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 but I can tell you, yeah. because I'm using BD pass, I can catch the cases and I can uh, emit a warning. Okay. So, one advantage of using macros and BD parse is I can catch all the edge cases of misuse and emit a warning and say, probably you, sh you don't really want to do this. And if you, if, um, if you think about Perl, a lot of things are implemented this way that you get a warning. Oh, it's an undef value and in uh, interpolated into a string. Do you really want to do this? So you have to silence the warnings. So you can have warnings which can be silenced. So this is my approach. We are nearly at the end. Questions? Uh, was it more or less understandable? Questions? OK. Well, cool is in the eye of the beholder. I can tell you. No, look, the problem is I had given talks, uh, given talks and talked about gather take, which is a very cool feature because the Python people are doing very cool things with yield. You have to write tons of code in Perl where Python people can, people can do it in three or four lines. But a lot of people which don't know this construct say, oh, yeah, nice, I don't need it. So the I am. I'm concentrating on the, on, on the cool features which I can use right away at my job. This means I can, I can use the time at my uh, paid time at my job and don't have to justify that I'm using this and this is signatures. Because I want to do more with the signature thing. Well, oh yeah, there's a cool thing. I want to emit automatic pods. So if I know the, wait a second. If I know 
the, that I'm expecting a positional argument, I'm expecting a named argument, and it has defaults. I can automatically create the pot. I can make introspection of the signature of a function. And if you've seen my talk, you've seen my talk yesterday about Emacs, I showed you the snippets how to create automatically the pot. This is not the cleanest way to do it. Creating the pot from the signature is the cleanest way to do it. And with 520 you can't do it because you have no way to introspect it yet. But this is a cool feature, creating the pot. And there are other things you can do with the signatures like, uh, yeah, you can support your IDE. So you have, uh, you you have a, you're starting to write uh, a function and uh, you, do, you get automatically from your IDE, uh, it says it expects this, 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 this uh, arguments in this way. And you can display it with the features I showed you yesterday in Emacs, which are also available in other IDEs. I can emit the, the, the code which is necessary to be passed by different IDEs to know what to show to the user. So we can have people which use these signatures and this is things which can be easily implemented now. We don't have to wait. We don't have to discuss. It's a good example. We don't have to discuss with 5D to implement it like they did it with the signatures with 520. And w another thing is I want, um, after uh, memorizing the signature, I want to bless uh, uh, the function reference of the function which is called. So if you're, you have introspection, you can go if it's a blessed reference, you can go inside and say, what's the signature in real time of this function? So these are maybe cool features, but cool is in the eye of the beholder. And I'm, I'm thinking, meditating for years about this stuff. The first time I thought about all this macro stuff was in um, 2009, and the Frankfurt Pearlmonger said, well, nice. <laughs> and. Um, and I have to find a way which pays off, where I have a synergy, where I can use it at my job and re-implement it and convince people to use it. Questions left? I don't know, when does the next talk start? No, no. Who's the next presenter? Okay, but uh, till he comes, you can ask. Come here. 